Hi, this is Brian Peckham uh, from Jesus Strong Ministries, coming to you again from Whitman, Massachusetts. I know it's been a while since I've um, done a video of me preaching and stuff. Um, if you go on my YouTube channel, you'll pretty much see most of me doing songs that I normally do at karaoke and stuff. You know, I like to have a good time and stuff. And, um, but one of the things that I don't do while I'm at karaoke is that I don't drink alcohol. And in this video that I'm going to enclose, I want to talk about the dangers of alcohol. There are so many Christians in the world today that say that moderate drinking is okay. No, it's not okay. It is a sin in the eyes of the Lord. And there are so many people that will debate likewise, saying that um, that it's not a sin, that it's okay to drink moderately. Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you this question. Is it okay to sin moderately? There are so many people that are out there that really don't fully understand the full meaning of grace. Okay? Grace doesn't give us the license to sin. Okay? Let's turn to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6 verse 1 and it says what then should we well then should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace you see it says that right in the Bible you see there are so many people okay that believe that if they keep on sinning and so forth that God will keep that God will continuously keep forgiving them and forgiving them and forgiving and forgiving them and forgiving them yes Jesus is a righteous God Jesus is righteous however Jesus does not want us to continue repeating the same sins over and over and over and over and over again okay now let's go to John chapter 8 real quick hold your Bible to Romans I'm gonna get back uh, to Romans okay now Jesus even answers this question okay so I want you to think about you know this question that we're reading here in Romans chapter 6 where it says well then should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace alright now let's turn to John chapter 8 verses 1 through 11 and this is what it says Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives but early the next morning he was back again at the temple a crowd soon gathered and he sat down and taught them. As he was speaking, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. They put her in front of the crowd. Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say? They were trying to trap him into saying something they could use against him, but Jesus stooped down and wrote in the dust with his finger. They kept demanding an answer. So he stood up again and said, All right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. Then he stooped down again and wrote in the dust. When the accusers heard this 
they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest, until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, Okay, now I want you to listen to these next few verses. Where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, Neither do I go and sin no more. Back to Romans chapter 6, verse 1. Should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? And Paul answered it in Romans chapter 6, verse 2. He said, of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Or have you forgotten that, that when we were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, we joined him in his death? For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. You see, when you give your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ, you see, Jesus doesn't want you to continue repeating the same sinful patterns that you have done before you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Jesus wants you to change. Okay, just like this woman that um, that was caught in the act of adultery. Jesus said to her, go and sin no more. Okay, and yet there are people, okay, that claim to be Christians and yet they are still living sinful lives. And Jesus doesn't want that. Okay, there are so many people that are that don't fully understand the true meaning of grace. Okay, grace is not your license to sin, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, if you think for a moment, okay, if you think for a moment that grace is your license to sin, you're in big trouble. Okay, if Jesus told the woman okay that was caught in the act of adultery go and sin no more what makes you think that Jesus is going to give you the license to sin huh think about that for a moment Jesus doesn't want you to continue in sin. If Jesus said to that woman that was caught in the very act of adultery, go and sin no more, he's saying the same words to you as well. Go and sin no more. All right, so when you give your heart and life to the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord doesn't want you to um, live the sinful life that you surrendered your life to. Jesus doesn't want you to go back to that old junk. He wants you to become a totally brand new person, okay? There are so many Christians that are out there that are in the world today that, that they are living double standard lives. Jesus doesn't want you to live a double standard life, ladies and gentlemen, okay? He doesn't want you to live a double standard life. He, he either wants you to be for him or against him. All right, let's turn to... The, uh, the, the book of Revelation, I believe it is. Um, I'm looking um, just to find the uh, the scripture here where it talks about um, 
how Jesus would doesn't want uh, the warm um, um, Christianity. I uh, I don't know it at the uh, top of my head, but um, I feel that the Spirit of the Lord is uh, leading me to um, talk about that uh, uh, for for a moment here. So if you just bear with me, I'm going to look that scripture up on the uh, computer here. Um, okay, and I'll give me um, Revelation 3:15. Uh, but I'm telling you, the wonder of technology, right? <laughs> so, um, I just went to BibleGateway.com, and it gave me the scripture. Alright. Revelation 3, um, 15. Jesus is saying this message to the church in uh, Laodicea. Laodicea, I believe it is. And this is what he wrote, and this is what he's saying. This is Jesus talking. And I'm going to begin in verse uh, 15. And he said, I know all the things you do, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were one or the other. But since you are like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Wow. That is some really strong words coming from our Lord here. You say, I am rich, I have everything I want, I don't need a thing, and you don't realize that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. So I advise you to buy gold from me, gold that has been purified by fire, then you'll be rich. Also buy white garments from me so you will not be shamed by your nakedness and ointment for your eyes, so you will be able to see. I correct and discipline everyone I love, so be diligent and turn from your indifference. And he says, Look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in, and we will share a meal together as friends. Those who are victorious will sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat with my father on his throne. But, like Jesus is saying, you see, this is, the, is, th this is pretty much the church of today, ladies and gentlemen. You know, they're lukewarm. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus does not want lukewarm so-called Christians. Jesus rather Jesus would rather have you hot for him or cold. It can't be both ways, ladies and gentlemen. You see, you you cannot, okay, you absolutely positively okay cannot have one foot living for for Jesus Christ and the other foot living for the devil okay you see we just cannot be you know on this on the road and be like okay I'm gonna live for God one moment and the next minute I'm going to do the things of the world and everything ladies and gentlemen we're different we are different from the world okay you want to know why we are different from the world it is because we have Jesus inside of our heart okay I don't know about you okay I have the Lord in my heart and brother David my uh, my co the, the co-leader of Jesus strong I know he has Jesus in his heart okay now, if we do things of the world, you see, then we then what we're doing is that we're becoming lukewarm. 
Jesus doesn't want lukewarmness. He rather, he, he like he said, he'd rather have you hot or cold. Okay? Not lukewarm. Okay? It's either hot or cold. Okay? Don't be lukewarm. Okay? Don't be lukewarm. Okay? Because we are different. We are different from the world. And I'm going to um, look up that scripture verse um, for you. Sorry for the, um, for, uh, New Testament here. I know it says um, be separate um, from the world, something like that. I know that um, I know that it's uh, somewhere um, I know it's uh, in here um, just bear with me I'm going to look this uh, I know it's somewhere um, around here. Let me go to another website and stuff. I'm going to uh, I'm going to find it for you, ladies and gentlemen. I am not going to leave you hanging because I don't want you thinking that you know these are my words because uh, they're not. This is the word of the Lord. Okay. It's amazing how you can find. All right, I found. It. Okay, turn with me to Second uh, Corinthians, um, chapter six. It's in here, folks. Second Corinthians, chapter six, uh, verse seventeen, and it says, "But the person who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with Him." So. Oh, I'm in 1 Corinthians. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> that happens sometimes. Blooper moment. Uh, I'm in 1 uh, Corinthians, and it was 2 Corinthians I wanted. Sorry about that. Um, it says, Therefore come out from among unbelievers, and separate uh, yourselves from them, says the Lord. 
Don't touch their filthy things. And I will welcome you. All right. Come out from among unbelievers. There are people in the world that that do not believe in the Lord. And Jesus is saying, come out from among unbelievers and sep se separate yourselves from them. Don't touch their filthy things, and I will welcome you. And there are a lot of things that are that are in the world of, that lukewarm Christians are Like what? What's the word I'm looking for? Help me, Lord. Here, um, the people that are lukewarm are doing things like of the world and touching the and touching things of the world that God doesn't favor. Okay, there are some Christians that so-called Christians. I don't even know why I'm calling them Christians. Okay. I should call them the so-called Christians. There are some people that claim to be Christians, okay, that believe that um, that smoking marijuana is okay. No, it ain't. No, it's not. Okay. There are some people. There are some so-called Christians that. Um, are drinking alcohol and, and so forth and it's not right okay and I want to um, find um, an article uh, on here And um, and this is what I want to um, talk about. Is it okay for is it okay to smoke marijuana? And um, I'm look, trying to find an article in here, but there's one thing that I want to say is that you know there are so many people that you know misinterpret um, you know there are so many people that are misinterpreting scripture I mean even Satan himself is um, Satan himself knows the word of the Lord and However, one thing that Satan does is that he misinterprets um, the word of the Lord. Right, let me... Uh, Okay, I love this article. This is by um, Deal uh, A. Robbins, and I want to read this article. Okay, there are some. I mean, like I said, you know, there are some Christians that totally believe that doing drugs is okay, and it's not. It's a sin, and you know, if you're a drug addict, okay, that you know from the past and you know you accepted you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior okay the Lord wants you to become dead of that sin nature you, you see why go back to the junk why go back to the junk if you received Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior why go back to it you see when you come to the foot of the cross ladies and gentlemen when you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior leave your junk leave your junk 
I'm going to say that one more time. Leave your junk at the foot of the cross. And whatever you do, do not pick it back up. Are you hearing me, ladies and gentlemen? When you come to the Lord Jesus Christ, leave your junk at the foot of the cross. Whether it may be drugs, whether it may be alcoholism, whether it may be lust, whatever the junk is. Whatever the junk is, ladies and gentlemen, leave it. Leave it. Leave it at the foot of the cross. Okay? And another thing too, okay, when you keep going back, okay, when you keep going back and you keep feeding the sin, when you keep feeding your sin, okay, you want to know what you're doing to yourself spiritually, okay? Let me give you an example, okay? If you read the book of Genesis, okay, and you and you see what happened in Sodom and Gomorrah, okay, God told Lot and his family to leave Sodom and Gomorrah, okay, and Abraham and, not Abraham, Lot and his family leave Sodom and Gomorrah, okay, however, Lot's wife looks back at the place of sin. She doesn't look forward to her road of victory. She looks backward at the sin. She looks back to sin. And what happens when she looks back at Sodom and Gomorrah? The word of the Lord says she turns into a pillar of of salt and when we keep looking back at our sinful lives ladies and gentlemen you know what we're doing we are becoming a pillar of salt spiritually ladies and gentlemen let me ask you this do you really want to clog up your spiritual life do you really want to clog up your spiritual life with the sin that you surrendered at the cross? Do you want to clog your spirit, your uh, your spiritual being up with the stuff of the world? When you do that, ladies and gentlemen, you are spiritually destroying yourself. Jesus didn't come for you to destroy yourself. Jesus came to make sure you had victory over that stuff. Okay? There are people, okay? I don't know if any of you have ever heard of Teen Challenge, okay? There, there are men and women that have gone through teen challenge, okay, with drug addictions and uh, alcohol addictions or whatever, okay. Some, some of them have uh, successfully done the program and they're living victorious lives. And yet there are some that go, th that have decided to look back at the, at the uh, sinful nature and so forth. And, and it's sad that they've done that. But you see, but you see, ladies and gentlemen, God, does, God doesn't want us to look back at the junk. He wants us to continue to look forward to Him. He wants us to look forward to Him, to the road of victory. When Jesus says, go and sin no more, He means he absolutely 100% means go and sin no more. 
He doesn't want us to keep repeating the same sin over and over and over again. He wants us to live in victory. Now, to this article about drugs and the Christian. And this is what Dale A. Robbins um, says. He says, Today in America, the widespread abuse of drugs and narcotics is a cancer that has devastated our nation. Drugs are linked to virtually every evil and criminal activity within our society. While it should be obvious that the use of mind-bending drugs is inappropriate for serious followers of Christ, yet there are Christians who occasionally attempt to justify their continued use of drugs, let us be reminded that if any person has genuinely become a new creature in Christ, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.17, it says, the old things are supposed to pass away, that all things should become new. Therefore, every believer should seek to put on the new creation of Christ and to put off the old life, including the continued use of mind-altering drugs and narcotics. Christians should not do drugs for the following seven reasons. Okay, number one, drugs have a proven connection with sorcery and witchcraft. Revelation 21.8 says, But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderous, sexually immoral sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone which is the second death according to w e vine's expository dictionary of new testament words page 1074 the word sorcery comes from a greek word pharmakia used as a noun it signifies a sorcerer one who uses drugs potions, spells, enchantments, as in Revelation 21.8. The English word for drugs pharmacy comes from the same root. Drugs and por potions have traditionally been used in witchcraft and satanic rituals to induce, to induce deeper subconscious states which enable persons to have fellowship and communication with demons. Realizing the satanic relationship with drug use helps us to understand why abusers of drugs experience such bondage and deprivation. Nowhere in the Bible or in history have drugs been used to bring people closer to God. They have always been used in relation to bringing people closer to evil powers and demonic influences. Hang on, I lost my in here. Okay. Drugs have an obvious affiliation with the desires of Satan. In the daily newspaper reports, the ravages of drugs are continually linked with the headlines of death, robbery, and destruction. If this sounds familiar, it should. According to the Bible, these happen to be the identical characteristics of Satan. John chapter 10 verse 10 says, The thief Satan does not come ex except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Satan is the evil inspiration behind the destructive nature of drugs. They are his own tools which, when persons are under the, their influence, accomplish his goals and fulfill his wicked desires, understanding the satanic relationship with drugs, Christians should find it easy to understand why drug use doesn't mix 
with a Christian lifestyle. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 21. Ooh, thank you, Jesus, hallelujah, for this verse. It says, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the Lord's table and of the table of demons. I'm going to read that one more time, ladies and gentlemen. I think that there are some people that are watching this video. You are not getting what I am saying here. You are not getting what I am saying. I'm going to say this verse again. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 21 says, You cannot, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the Lord's table and of the table of demons. What does this mean, ladies and gentlemen? What does it mean? Hopefully I have an illustration to tell you of what this means. And I do. Thank you, Lord. As followers of Christ, we must give him our total allegiance. We cannot, as Paul explains, have a part in the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. Eating at the Lord's table means communing with Christ and identifying with his death. Drinking from the cup of demons means identifying with Satan by worshiping or promoting pagan or evil activities are you leading two lives trying to follow both Christ and the crowd the Bible says that you can't do both at the same time and ladies and gentlemen that is one thing that is happening with today's so-called Christians today there are people that think that they can live a double standard life. You cannot live the double standard life. It's either one or the other. It's either you live for Jesus or you live for the devil. It's one way or the other. You cannot have it both ways. You cannot be a Christian and do drugs or do, or do alcohol at the same time. It just can't happen. It's either you do one or the other. It's either you love one and hate the other or and so forth and so forth. It's, it's either you love Jesus and hate sin or love sin or hate Jesus. That's the way it is ladies and gentlemen. You cannot love Jesus and love sin at the same time. It just can't happen. Jesus didn't die on the cross for you to live a, a life of sin. The cross isn't your license to sin. Ladies and gentlemen, if you think that the cross is your license to sin, you're in big trouble. You are absolutely in big trouble. If you, if you turn around and you say that the cross is your license to sin, you know what you're saying? Do you know what you are saying? You are pretty much saying that Jesus Christ went to the cross in vain. Think about that. You're pretty much saying that Jesus Christ went to the cross in vain. And ladies and gentlemen, I just want to say to you right now,
Jesus Christ did not go to the cross in vain. Jesus Christ went to the cross so that each and every single one of us may have life and have life more abundantly. That is why he went to the cross for you and for me. Jesus Christ died so that we may have life and that we may have that life more abundantly. He doesn't want you to have a life of sin. He wants you to have a life of victory. Glory be to God. Drugs, drug use will cause others to, some, to stumble. According to the Bible, believers are accountable to avoid anything which would lead our brethren astray or cause them to stumble in their relationship with God. Romans 14 chapter 21 says, It is good neither to eat meat nor drink wine nor do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. For the sake of our brethren in Christ and for our own protection from temptation, the Bible tells us to refrain from anything that may even appear sinful, abstain from every form of evil, which we see in First Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 22 those who are mature in the Lord are supposed to use their lifestyles as an example for others to follow they deny selfish desires and personal preferences in order to minister to those who are less mature Romans chapter 15 verses 1 through 3 it says we then who are strong ought to bear with the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good leading to edification. But even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. Christians are no longer their own. The Bible says that we belong to the Lord and we are to glorify Him with our body and with the way we live. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 20 says, For you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31 says, Therefore, whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. We're not to be infected by mind-bending stimulants. The Bible warns believers to not be intoxicated by alcohol. Woo! Now listen here. Listen here. The Bible warns believers to not be intoxicated by alcohol and by implication other stimulants such as drugs, which distorts our thinking or alters our ability to control our behavior. Instead, the scriptures teach that we should be under the influence of God's power. That is, we should be filled with His Spirit, which gives us the buzz of His power, His peace, and strength. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 17 through 18 says, Therefore, do not be unwise but understand what the will of the Lord is. 
and do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation but be filled with the spirit and in, and we are warned not to defile God's temple 1st Corinthians chapter 3 verse 16 and 17 says do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you if anyone defiles the temple of God God will destroy him are you hearing me this isn't the words ladies and gentlemen of Brian Peckham this is the word of the Lord if anyone defiles the temple of God God will destroy him for the temple of God is holy which temple you are once again we are reminded that Christians are God's possession and in fact they are the dwelling place of his spirit for this reason we must consider our body something sacred not something to be trashed or abused the world defile means to pollute foul or corrupt so if we are putting drugs into our body if we are putting alcohol into our body if we are putting lustful thoughts into our body or sexual immorality in our body whatever it is where we are abusing the temple of God you see ladies and gentlemen you were not created by Satan you were created in God's image the Bible even says that God knew you even when you were inside the womb of your mother he knew you and even when you were in the womb he had a plan and he had a purpose for your life are you hearing me tonight people even when you were in the womb Jesus Christ had a plan and a purpose for your life. He knew you even before your mom and your dad knew you. Ladies and gentlemen, he saw you in the womb. And when he saw you in the womb, he saw you as precious. You were precious in his sight. Even today, you are precious in his sight. It doesn't matter who you are it doesn't matter who is listening to this message you are beautiful and you are precious in the sight of the Lord continuing on in this article any an addiction is anything we cannot free ourselves from which overrules our freedom to choose whether physically or psychologically as Christians we are given power over habits and behavior they should not have power over us 1st Corinthians chapter 6 verse 12 says all things are lawful for me 
but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Now, before I read this next part, I just want to read to you about this other article that, um, that I pulled up about the dangers of, um, of alcohol. And, um, and this, um, is an article that, um, came from the show, uh, Francis and Friends over on, um, Sun Life Broadcasting, uh, network and stuff, uh, from Jimmy Swagger, um, ministries and stuff. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to read the article and however the spirit of the Lord leads me as I'm reading this article, I mean, like I read, you know, the other article and stuff, I mean, if the spirit of the Lord gives me something to say while I'm reading the article, then you know what, that's what I'm going to do. Amen. I don't know about you, but I really sense the Spirit of the Lord as I'm bringing forth this to you. I know that there are going to be some people that are going to be mad at what I'm saying. But you know what? I'm, go I'm just going to tell you this. Okay? I'm going to tell you straight up. Okay? I'm going to tell you straight up. If you have a problem with anything that I am saying on this video, ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you something. Your problem's not with me. Your problem is not with me. Your problem is with God. Your problem is with God. Your problem is not with this minister. Your problem is with God if you do not like what I'm bringing forth to you here tonight. Because these are not the words of Brian Peckham. These are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, I did not write this book. I did not write this book. This book has been around even before I was even born. So if you have a problem with what I am saying, take it to the Lord. Take it to the Lord. Because He is the only one that can help you realize what is going on in your life. You see, I'm not, I'm not preaching a feel-good message. I know that I am convicting some hearts right now. And I pray that as you're listening to what I am saying to you right now, I just pray that as you're listening to what I am saying, that the Spirit of the Lord opens your eyes and your ears to what I am bringing forth to you tonight. I pray that you will gain understanding of what I'm bringing forth. And I pray that you will become a stronger Christian in the Lord as you are listening to what I'm saying to you tonight. And it's sad to and it's very sad to say that there are not that many preachers in the world that would preach hardcore like this. And ladies and gentlemen, if you read the Bible, if you read any of the Gospels, okay, ladies and gentlemen, there were times that Jesus was hardcore. There were times that Jesus was hardcore 
and some of the things that that Jesus said some people didn't like to hear but ladies and gentlemen like the word of the Lord says you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free okay if you only want to hear what you want to hear it, it isn't going to help you it isn't going to help you but if you open yourself up to what the Holy Spirit wants to reveal to you if you open yourself up to what the Holy Spirit wants to do in your life then allow the Holy Spirit allow the Holy Spirit to do what he wants in your life glory be to God I spoke a little bit about drugs now I want to talk about alcoholism and um, I just want to see how how long I'm going I'm going over a little bit an hour here Wow but this is good stuff that I totally feel that you need to hear. And um, and this is from Fra Francis and Friends. And she's talking about the dangers of alcohol. And she said, recently we discussed a topic on Francis and Friends that she believed built, that bared repeating. And it was the subject of alcohol and she opened the show by reading an email and this is what it said it said on your program you got on the subject of alcohol again and I wonder why this is such a big issue to you I never drank and I have no desire to but almost every Christian has an occasional glass of wine my husband was told by his doctor to have a glass of wine each night to help his heart. The Bible doesn't discourage drinking in moderation. Say what? So why do you keep harping on it? Even the extremely conservative Protestant Reformation churches here call wine a gift from God. I don't drink so I'm not trying to justify it. I I just think it's quite legalistic to condemn something that the Bible doesn't condemn. Drunkenness is another matter, though entirely. And then Francis goes on to say, well, that email went on to address other topics. She says, I want to deal with these comments made about alcohol because they come up again and again from our audience. One point the email addressed concerns Christians and social drinking. Just what is the harm in a Christian drinking one glass of wine on a holiday or special occasion? And she goes on to say, I liked how our panelist associate pastor Jim Nations responded to the issue. As one of our associate pastors here at the ministry, Jim does quite a bit of counseling on this topic. And he was quick to mention Proverbs uh, chapter 20, verse 1, which reads, Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. The Holy Spirit here says that wine mocks, and it causes a raging in the hearts and lives of all who imbibe. As well, it is a great deceiver. This means that every believer ought to be a Tito taller. Think about what the Holy Spirit is saying to us in this verses, verse of Scripture. As Christians, we should not be deceived by the mockery of alcohol because its use causes so much hurt and pain to people. As Jim went on to say, no one starts out as a drunk. They start out 
with a drink. That's why we will continue to address the problem of alcohol even when others perceive our stand against it as judgmental. And she goes on to say, I think what we're doing instead of being judgmental is that we're looking at the facts. It's a well no, it's well known that drunk driving has killed maybe more people than anything else. In 2010, more than 10,000 people died in alcohol-impaired driving crashes, according to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. That's one death every 51 minutes. Just recently, I read. She, Francis Swigert said she read stories of two lovely Christian families that had their lives literally shattered because of drunk drivers who either killed or maimed members of their families affecting these precious people for the rest of their lives. Tragedies like these started with one drink or one glass of wine. And she goes on to say, I'm sure it makes little difference to families who have suffered such painful losses to know that the person who killed their loved one was a social drinker or, ha or a hardcore drunkard. Too many of us hear these numbers and shrug our shoulders, but we are talking about death, death. And many of the people who died in alcohol-related car crashes did not know Jesus Christ as their personal savior. How can a Christian condone anything that causes souls to be lost to an eternal hell? According to scripture, believers have a responsibility. We are not to cause others to stumble. We are our brother's keeper. So even if you can have one drink and stop, you don't know who will not be able to stop. You don't know who will become the next alcoholic or drunk driver. So your social moderate drinking is actually quite unloving. You do not love your brother. And whosoever shall offend one of these little ones who believe in me, it is better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he was cast into the sea. Mark chapter 9 verse 42. The email also stated the Bible doesn't discourage drinking in moderation, but Francis Swagger said she begs to defer. The Bible certainly doesn't encourage moderate drinking. In fact, there are many warnings in scripture regarding alcohol. One verse says not to even look at wine. In other words, don't even consider it. Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has contentions? Who has babbling? Who has wounds without cause? Who has redness of eyes? They that tarry long at the wine, they who go to seek mixed wine, look not you upon the wine when it is red, when it gives his color in the cup, when it moves itself aright. At the last it bites like a serpent and stings like an adder. Your eyes shall behold strange women, and your heart shall utter perver perverse things, which we see in Proverbs chapter 23, verses 29 through 33. And alcohol is like any other sin. It gets a hold on you. First you take one drink, then two makes you feel better, then three makes you feel even more carefree. Before you know it, you're keeping a bottle hidden in your desk at home or purchasing it on airplanes when you fly. Once addicted to alcohol, you find ways to get it. Alcohol is a serious, serious problem and addiction. We have people out there who are struggling within an inch of taking their own life because of this sin that so many others are trying to justify. Sadly, we have pastors preaching in churches that social drinking is acceptable. There are some pastors that even drink themselves, sad to say.
The seriousness of alcohol use becomes very clear when you get an email from a self-described alcoholic ready to take his own life because he couldn't stop drinking. And she goes on to say, I received an email exactly like that during the program on this topic. He wrote, please help me. I am so thankful that we were able to pray with that man and give him the hope of the gospel. What I told him applies to anyone struggling to break free from alcohol, and that is this, the Lord Jesus Christ is standing there with an outstretched hand, and he is desiring to break every bondage and save your soul from an eternal hell and give you life, and life more abundantly. Jesus Christ can and will set you free. You see, alcoholism is only a symptom. Sin is the root of the problem. So while this ministry may so while that ministry may be viewed as judgmental, even myself, because we preach a message of consecration, we will continue to do so because the only answer to this sin of alcoholism is found in the cross of Jesus Christ. She goes on to say, I have never taken a drink of wine or any alcohol, so I can't speak of its so-called benefits. But all of us have seen or read in the news about alcohol's effects. Excuse me, what? Will you excuse me? I have to help. i got to do something. Oh, excuse me. Sorry about that. I had to help my aunt out. Um, and she goes on to say, I have never taken a drink of wine or any alcohol, so I can't speak of so called benefits. But all of us have seen or read in the news about alcohol's effect on other people, how it makes them act, and what it can make them do. For some, their personality completely changes when, they're, when they get a little dr drink under their belt, so to speak. People who drink lose their dignity and start acting foolish and silly. Others turn mean and violent, capable of doing untold harm to their families or themselves. Police reports show that alcohol use is a direct contributor. To reported cases of domestic violence and child abuse. So I failed to, to see why people, especially Christians, would want to defend the use of alcohol in any amount. Excuse me, what? I'm doing a video. I'm doing a video. Excuse me. I'm doing a video. Again, I do apologize for that. Um, all right, where was I? Um, Police reports show that alcohol use is a direct contributor to reported cases of domestic violence and child abuse. So I fail to see why people, especially Christians, would want to defend the use of alcohol in any amount. Yet there are plenty of doctors and even preachers who defend the use of alcohol, saying there is nothing wrong with drinking in moderation. We have pastors preaching today that social drinking is acceptable and sadly some drink themselves, like I just said. Remember, so goes the church, so goes the nation. Actually, the main health benefit, the resveratrol, is really found in the grape, not the alcohol itself. If you want the benefit of the grape, drink grape juice or eat grapes. It's simply an excuse for sin to try to say you are drinking alcohol for health reasons. 
any benefit can easily be found from other sources. In fact, there are actually many health risks to drinking alcohol. Why do you think they ask you if you drink alcohol when you apply for health insurance? Because there is actually greater risk for adverse effects to your health than there are benefits. As Brother Carl Brown pointed out on the Francis and Friends program, Christians who don't really want to consecrate to the Lord are the ones who take up issues such as social drinking. And he is absolutely correct. Quit simply put, drinking alcohol appeals to the flesh, not to the spirit. The Holy Spirit will never lead one to drink alcohol. Churches defending alcohol use may as well have a big red neon sign blinking for everybody to see that says, We've lost the power of God and we're having to imitate. In other words, we've got to put something in to take the place of the moving and operation of the Holy Spirit. Ladies and gentlemen, be assured that there is absolutely nothing else that compares to the anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit in our personal lives and in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. For these are not drunken as you suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel and it shall come to pass in the last days saith God I will pour out of my spirit all flesh Acts chapter 2 verses 15 through 17 as believers the Lord gives us the power to live a consecrated life and he reminds us in 1st Corinthians chapter 6 verse 19 like I just read that our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit something in man always thinks that he can control sin something in him says oh I can handle this I can stop at one drink but when you play around with sin when you play around with fire you get burned you are actually dealing with the spiritual realm and believe me, no mortal man is stronger than the spiritual powers of darkness. Like I said, you are playing with fire. This is what you call deception. It's deception to think you can drink moderately, and it has no effect on you. You are deceived. What if a problem arises in your life? You may turn to the alcohol when you never thought you would, that you would have before. You are tempting yourself in God to try to drink moderately. And Matthew 4, 7 says, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Even if you do not become an alcoholic, drinking alcohol can affect your spirituality in other ways. It is more than a coincidence that alcohol is referred to as spirits. Alcohol, like any other drug, actually opens your mind to the spirit world. Satan has more leeway to plant suggestions in your mind that are anti-biblical when you use drugs. It is a well-known fact that other religions purposely use drugs in order to get in touch with their gods or spirits, which we as believers know are nothing more than demon spirits. People often hallucinate after drinking, particularly after a tragic event or a stressful time in their life these hallucinations are demonic in nature they often appear as familiar spirits the Bible says that the last days would be marked by um, pharmakia sorcery drugs in Revelation 18 23 it says for by your sorceress sorceries were all nations deceived so maybe so maybe you will not become the next alcoholic but you may engage in some other sin many end up in fornication or homosexuality because they have opened themselves up to spirits or lust of lust through alcohol and drug use many became angry and even commit murder under the influence of drugs many begin to believe false doctrine and fall away from truth in some way 
you may leave the message of the cross. You see, if you give your mind over to Satan often enough, if you yield your mind to spirits rather than the Holy Spirit often enough, you will have no control over what lies you start to believe. Be sober, be vigilant, because your, ad your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. 1 Peter 5 8. When people are given over to false doctrine, it's actually a sign of God's judgment. And Francis says, I don't find it a coincidence that both false doctrines and the acceptance of alcohol are on the rise in our churches. The two go hand in hand. Really, any believer should be convicted of drinking alcohol, but many have pushed away the conviction and chosen not to obey. The Holy Spirit will never lead you astray, but he does not force us to obey him either. If we push him away, he will not override our will or, fo or force us to repent. Neither, in Revelation 9.21 it says, Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of, their, nor of the thieves. This is why it is so important for believers to develop a close personal relationship with the Lord and be spirit-led. He will show you right from wrong, but you must draw near to Him. The more you allow Him to be the Lord of your life, the more that answers to moral questions such as these become very simple. It's our own thinkings and intellect that get in the way. It's our intellect that devises excuses or tries to justify our sins. Look to the Lord for your answers. Now, right now, I want to do something. I have given you a lot of, I've given you a lot of chew tonight. I should say, but there's more. There really, really is more that I could um, bring forth um, to the table here tonight. And um, but, anyways. If you are addicted to drugs or alcohol, ask Christ to give you power to overcome them, and he will. Don't seek to justify your addiction, but keep reaching toward full and complete freedom. But as many as received him to them, he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. John chapter 1 verse 12. And in James chapter 5 verse 15 it says, Seek the anointed prayers of church leaders and other Christians. God promises to honor their prayer of faith to help you. Be encouraged. God will never condemn you. God will never condemn the person who keeps reaching out to him, who keeps trying to grow and make progress in him. If you sin, ask him to forgive you. In 1 John 1, 9. Then you get up and keep moving and keep moving on and growing closer to him. And be assured, the closer you draw to him, the further he will withdraw you from the old life of sin and bondage to drugs and alcohol. And I just want to give you this opportunity right now. If you've never received Jesus 
as your personal Lord and Savior, and you want to do so right now, all you have to do, ladies and gentlemen, is just say this prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, I know I am a sinner. I believe you died for my sins. Right now I turn from my sins and open the door of my heart and my life. I receive you as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for saving me. Amen. And amen. And this is probably one of, uh, well, not quite. Um, I thought it might have been one of the longest videos that that I have done, but it's not. And uh, like I said, I know I've given you a lot to chew here tonight in this video. And I just want to let you know I'm not sorry for it. You know, like the Word of the Lord says, you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So, this is Brian Peckham from Jesus Strong Ministries, coming to you again from Massachusetts. And I just want to say, God bless. May the Lord richly bless you. Until we meet again. God bless.